And I was very fortunate as a young kid coming up from Urbana in 1966 to somehow have the extraordinary good fortune of meeting both Mike Royko and Studs Terkel within the first few months after I arrived here. Remember the time we took Doris Lessing around and showed her Chicago? And we had some, uh, some great times. And Mike, I remember it was January the 1st, 1967, New Year's Day. As I recall, it was a Saturday, so the Daily News would not be published the next day. I was uh, part-time at the Sun-Times. I was working on an article. It was late that night. There were still a few people putting out the Sun-Times, but over on the Daily News side of the floor, all the lights were out except for one, and it was Mike's light that was still on. And um, he was working on something, and I got up my nerve. He, of course, was my hero. I went over to say hello to him, and there was a big snowstorm outside. Not the great snowstorm, but just a big preliminary snowstorm. And he asked me how I was getting home, and I said, I didn't know. And he said, well, I've got my, I think it was his father's checkered cab. His father was not a cab driver. His father owned a checkered car, which somehow <laughs> figures. And um, he says, I'll give you a ride home, but we have to stop at North of Milwaukee first. I have to pick up a prescription at the drugstore there. There's an all-night drugstore at North of Milwaukee. Only Mike, I mean, there are all-night drugstores around town, but only Mike would deal with the one at North of Milwaukee. And... Um, so we walked in, and the druggist hadn't prepared the prescription yet, so Mike said, well, let's go. There's an uh, eye-opener place over here. Let's stop in, and, you know, it's 11 o'clock at night, time for an eye-opener. It was a little bar underneath the L-track, so small that the guy who ran it could reach every stool, <laughs> the cash register, and his entire stock without getting up from where he was seated. And uh, Mike and I were both just a little bit in need of the hair of the dog on New Year's Day, and Mike recommended blackberry brandy. That'll sell your stomach and make you feel better. It's uh, really basically medicinal. <laughs> and so we both ordered blackberry brandy, and I'm thinking, you know, like an hour ago, I didn't know Mike Royko. And now I'm in a shot in a beer eye opener joint underneath the L tracks at North of Milwaukee drinking blackberry brandy with him. This is fabulous. I was just, I was a kid from Urbana, you know, this was, this was wonderful. And the, the guy had the radio on and he was listening to the Blackhawks hockey game. I, of course, being from downstate Illinois, had never seen a hockey game in person, had never seen one on television, had never heard one on the radio. I knew there was a game named hockey. Um, but I would, I had, my second shot of blackberry brandy and I wanted to be cool and after a while and the Blackhawks were doing great they kept scoring goals one after another finally I said boy they're really doing great they seem to be scoring a goal every 30 seconds and Mike looked at me and he said you doofus it's the instant replay <laughs> and that was the beginning of a relationship that lasted many years I grew older but no matter how old I grew, I was still the kid from the sticks, from downstate Illinois, and Mike was always giving me lessons in life, politics, philosophy, movies. He was always my teacher, and I was always the pupil. I got to be 40, I got to be 50, and he was still patiently teaching me. This is a column from July the 10th, 1970. There were 30 minutes to go before the private screening of his first movie, so screenwriter Roger Ebert nervously asked the bartender for a shot and a beer chaser. That was bold drinking for so young a man. Sure enough, he coughed on the shot. <laughs> then he stuck me with the bar bill. Remember, he said, I'm saving you $3 by inviting you to my free screening. I have heard about your movie, and you are not saving me a nickel. <laughs> Roger lapsed into a glum silence. Ebert, the popular, talented movie critic of the Sun-Times, had done something few critics would dare. He had written a screenplay for the film Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. <laughs> Even before it opened here, critics in other cities put aside any fraternal affection they may have felt for him. <laughs> it is sure to disgust you, raved a West Coast critic. Don't miss missing it, said New York. Using Ebert's own movie rating system, four stars for great, one star for terrible, he was averaging about one handful of crater dust per review. 
The critics had generally agreed that the movie was dirty, violent, and not much fun. I seldom see these kinds of movies since a normal day in Chicago can be dirty, violent, and not much fun. But Ebert had arranged for a private screening. He wanted his friends to see his film. We got there a few minutes late. A breast was already bounding across the screen. <laughs> Did we miss the first act, I asked? <laughs> yeah, I answered a voice from the darkness, the first abnormal one. It's not easy to read notes that were scribbled in darkness, but I can transcribe these from my notepad. Bare breasts, bottoms, naked couples, in bed, in bubble bath, in haystack, in Rolls Royce. Two young men, good grief. <laughs> Toe fetish, old man, young girl. Young man, old girl. Young man, then I wrote, only half over. <laughs> I can't report on my notes for the second half, which is when the violence came in because it is difficult to write when you have both hands clapped over your eyes. It was something like the final cattle shoot in the stockyards, except the movie used people. When the lights went on, I was glad for Ebert that the room was filled with his friends. Strangers might have beaten them with their chairs. <laughs> My reaction once I got outside and breathed the fresh, polluted air was one of puzzlement. I'd always assumed, since I didn't know any, that creeps wrote all the dirty, violent movies. In fact, I had hoped they were written by creeps because this would keep them busy and they wouldn't be climbing up my rose trellis and peeking in my bathroom window. <laughs> but Ebert is not a creep, just the opposite. He is a peaceful, pleasant, thoughtful young man, only 26 or 27 with a cherubic face and a great writing talent. While still a student, he wrote a history of a university and it was a clean book. which used to be possible when writing about universities. <laughs> Later, as we all leaned on a bar, Ebert asked his friends what they thought. We told him. This time, he uttered a double shot in a beer. <laughs> Why did you write a dirty, violent movie? I finally asked him. It was written as a parody of dirty, violent movies, he said. Did the producer and director know that? Although I am not a movie critic, I think I figured out what went wrong and how so talented a writer and so decent a young man could be involved in that dog. Ebert's problem is that he is not a dirty old man. If a dirty movie is going to be any good, it has to be written by a dirty old man. You wouldn't let an ROTC T student, student write a war movie or a Republican write a book about Chicago politics. <laughs> I believe that every young man is entitled to one big mistake, despite what the alimony court judges may say. And this movie is Ebert's, and I urge you to avoid it. <laughs> Someday he will write another movie, and I'm confident that it will be excellent. Even if it is dirty, it will be better. I will be his technical advisor. <laughs>